and raise money to get your stack back together. Like blowing out your account and waking up to liquidation emails is like the, the bog standard, you know, trader's life. It's and, and if you get good at it, you ruined your life. You're getting good at taking someone else's money from them. You're not net useful for society. You're a loser. Being good at trading is the worst thing you could ever do for yourself. Go learn to create a good or a service that someone will give you their money for voluntarily. And stop dreaming that you're helping price discovery. Having people to, amplify yeah. FOMO tops is not helping price discovery. I have to be honest. The, the funds that were generated through trading have actually enabled uh, the present uh, presentation of, of services and products to the market. So uh, perhaps I, I am in line with what you suggest is a proper strategy. To, to yeah, but launch. if the products and services are rolling more people into the meat grinder, then it's worse, not better. You know, like all these guys that run successful scams and get money, like Tone Vase, they go and use that money to buy ads to scam more people. It's like a, a negative <laughs> reinforcing circle. And by the way, you talked about not being able to hold for a long time. Imagine how many people would be rich in Bitcoin right now if they didn't sell on a 2X or a 10X, if they held for the 10,000X. My product that I invented literally forces you to have diamond hands because you're locking up your coins. You lock up your coins at the choice of time that you should. I think I never really talk about it. Look, you can choose how long you want to do it. One day to 15 years. You choose. And then they're locked. The longer you lock, the more you make. The shorter you lock, the less you make. You don't have to lock. The majority of the gains is against USD anyway. Like it went up 10,000 X versus the dollar in two years. You didn't need to lock at all. If you locked, you got 20,000 X versus the dollar, depending on how long you'd locked for. And so if you're worried about weak hands, it's solved already. Like hex solves that, right? Like if you're worried about mad gains, hex solves that. If you're worried about counterparty rest, hex solves that. If you're worried about volatility, hex does not solve that. It's volatile as shit, right? Like Bitcoin dropped 75. Ethereum dropped 85 and Hex dropped 95. And so, like, it, it, you know, that comes with the game. But I just thought it uniquely addressed the idea that people wouldn't be able to find long-term success because we literally reward you with inflation to be long-term minded. And, and these guys that are destroying their lives with trading, we see the opposite in Hex because you have something to look forward to in the future now. You have an end stake date. And a lot of people have a bunch of them. You know, they make one per year. And so on a certain day, for the next X number of years of your life, you're getting paid and you're making mad interest. And that interest cancels out a lot of dip, I might tell you. So like, I, I think I think that Hex is the cure to people getting destroyed, degenerating on all types of gambling, whether it be casino gambling, sportsbook gambling, or, you know, ticker symbol gambling, or, or trying to time the market or, or guess which way the price is gonna go gambling. Hey guys, uh, Noah from Whalecoin Talk here. I just wanted to, to give my two cents. I, I'm pretty much in the camp of Richard. I, I've i been in the space since 2017 and my, my strategy has basically been increased cash flow and DCA, mainly in the Bitcoin. I started seeing the Ethereum more in 2018, but I've seen a lot of, and this is my own anecdotal experience. I've seen a lot of traders, a lot of traders, very loud, um, very sure of themselves. You know, they, they come into the market fresh. They start to get big wins and most of them aren't around anymore. And I'm not denying that people can make careers off of day trading. I'm I doubt it's 10%. I'd have to guess. It. But um, I just, I'm just not sold that it is, it is a viable career path for the majority or even a large minority of people simply because of the way that trading works. Like Richard said, it, it, at the end of the day, you might be on a win streak, but someone's going to figure out what you're doing. Like it, it's a, it's a dog eat dog. I have buddies that trade options and it's just a dog eat dog environment. And most, as I said, most of the traders that I tone is probably one of the few ones that are willy woo. I mean, these guys, these guys are right until they're wrong and they're very loud with their opinions. And typically their followers end up getting wrecked and typically the courses don't end up helping anyone. Willy woo's fund literally went bankrupt like a year ago, literally went bankrupt. Holy shit. Yeah, Willy Woo had a fund. There you went fucking I mean, bankrupt. There you have it. So I, I just, I don't really, I, my, again, my own anecdotal, my own anecdotal experience is like, I don't particularly, uh, actually, I'm not going to say I don't believe in TA, but it hasn't, it hasn't worked for me and I haven't seen it work long term viably for really anyone in my circle. So that's just, that's my two cents. I DCA into Bitcoin and Ethereum, maybe some layer ones. And not layer ones, but blue chips, and and hope for the best. Increase cash flow. Yeah, I, I, I want to say, and I will give the mic to FF right after. He's been patiently waiting. But I want to say, as a, as a non-trader, 
aren't isn't crypto or at least nft today crypto a few years ago isn't it inefficient enough for you to be able to grab you know there's a guy that came to us he's like guys i have you know i can know i've seen a pattern every coin that has xyz happen on this exchange has pumped for the last six months so i'm my strategy is to go invest in these coins that i know will do xyz afterwards i know it's very vague because i don't want to give away a strategy we're just testing it now first time i test something in trading um nfts Almost everyone, we talked about it last Tuesday, almost everyone that was trading NFTs just made money. Now, it's going to get more efficient. The institutional guys are going to come in, and then that won't be possible anymore. But would you say every new asset class within crypto starts off inefficient enough for you to be able to get an edge somehow? I don't think that's an edge. That's just gambling and luck. Um, would, would, is there any... What, what, when you say you're trading NFTs, do you mean you're just picking something in a bull market and it goes up? Everything was going up in a bull market, so it's that argument. Uh, and then there's the patterns that every NFT that had XYZ influence to talk about it. Again, I didn't flip NFTs and I've never traded anything. But that's why you know, we just hired an NFT trader yeah. that joined this that is, team. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that worked for you, but th this is the type of thing as a market maker we used to take advantage of. So... Um, but there's you know, not. But that's the thing. That's the thing. Like the, there is market making in tokens. You know, we work with a bunch of them for our projects. I, I didn't do that NFT thing I'm talking about. I just one of my friends has, and he work, works with me. But there's no market makers in the NFT space, for example. Yeah, but what I'm just saying, as as a market maker, like what we used to do is just pick the things that people were talking about, pump the price, um, get create some liquidity. Um, we're working an order to the opposite side, on the other side from the smart money. Um, and then all the retail are losing at the expense of the smart money um, where we're working a trade for Goldman's or something. Uh, and it's the same with all the exchanges. Like the, you know, the, you're, you're, you're literally, you are trading against um, the people that control the markets. And the people that control the markets are the insiders and whales that are manipulating prices, sending out signals by putting things into, um, you know, I, I, I just if, if you if you can do it and, and keep doing it, but it sounds like you just sound and you found a, a, an opportunity. It made some money at the time and then it disappears. Yes, I think that's how I'd put it. You, you find opportunities when the markets are inefficient. It's very nascent because then the, the and then it starts getting centralized with a bunch of influencers. It happened in the NFT space. What happens is that influencers would, would FUD a project on purpose. Everyone sells. They buy it up. Obviously, it worked until it didn't work anymore. They buy it up and then starts um, pumping it. And then what my guy started doing when it worked was like every time they fud it, he starts buying it because they know they're going to uh, pump it up afterwards. Now, this is the shit that I hate in this space. And this is the shit that I've never, you know, I've never traded. Again, I just want to make that very clear. But FF, you, you know, you're in the NFT space. It, it, what I'm saying, is it right? Because again, I wasn't there in the bull run in the NFT space. Um, no, but the, these, are the, these are the behaviors that's going to, that exactly what's going to turn NFTs into securities by these exact behaviors. Yes, yes, Because if, yes, if, people, if people are trading these things, pumping and dumping them, then the regulators are going to eventually see this as a way of circumventing securities laws and say, all right, um, everyone's getting wrecked here. Everyone now, all these people are now complaining to me. Let's call them securities. And then it wrecks the whole use case of what an NFT was meant to be. Yeah, I saw, uh, I saw a little but bit. But there's no, there's no way of stopping it. That, that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a little Sorry, bit of both. You know, I saw both like pump, positive pumps and negative pumps during that bull. Just like um, someone was saying, you know, it, it was very easy to make money during that bull run. Uh, everybody was making money, you know. And uh, I thought, just like Richard was saying, because when I started making money off of NFTs and stuff like that, I thought I was a goddamn genius. But, you know, during this bull, it didn't turn out that way <laughs> as much. But... Um, yeah, I saw a little bit of both. You know, the, I, I did see people during the bear more frequently pumping up positively so they can because um, they would all these influence would, would already be buying beforehand, etc. Um, lots of insider trading rumors. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But, you know, there's always people that form groups and manipul manipulate, you know, different aspects. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, bro. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, then, you know, and then manip manipulate others to, you know. Um, everybody that has a, some sort of a reach, they would um, obviously have everybody tweet this in some sub sort of manner. And even fake drama, you know, there's people out there doing um, fake fights, fake shit, just because um, the, they can get more noticeable or things like that. Um, I do want to ask Simon a question. 
you earlier you said that um you know you kind of go off at like psychology type of not trades necessarily but investments and things like that um very curious because I, I think i'd like to i think i i do the same in the nft thing but um the crypto thing is very interesting very uh, i'm curious on how you play that out yeah i i don't trade so um i'm i'm just uh you know as you said i i have income i invest a set amount the same way every single month um i have a thesis that bitcoin is digital hard sound money um ETH can outperform it in a bull market underperform it in a bear market um and uh i buy shares in companies and then i i create scenarios for um what happens if central bank digital currencies um hey, that was hey, real, real that quick was you used to be able to buy 2000 ethereum for one bitcoin now you can buy like did, yeah. 15 15 ethereum for one bitcoin yeah you no, used to get 2000 at the crowd still, sale now you get 15 it's up like i don't know hundreds I, of x or something i've still i still got i haven't moved my ethereum ico tokens i still got them I just don't want anyone to think that Bitcoin's a better play than Ethereum. It's like, especially now that Ethereum is like <laughs> super hard money. You know what I mean? No, to me, it's, it's risk adjusted. So ev everyone has to pick their base, right? So if you guys that are trading, um, what's your base? What are you actually trying to earn? Are you are you trying to earn dollars? Are you trying to earn Bitcoin? Are you trying to earn ETH? What's your what's your base? What are you trying to build? Profit. Up? I just want profit. I mean, I've been trading for yeah. Years. So profit means you want dollars, right? For years, like, and you know, you can say that trading isn't successful or you can't be successful. I mean, there's plenty of success, and I've done it, man. Like, I no, bought a what, you, what house. I'm, with yeah, profit, what I'm is property, your base? assets, like. You know, you, you can what, trade and, and make money. And that's what it's for. Yeah, I trade them to but, make profit. But, but by money, what's your base? You want dollars, right? From what you're saying, it sounds like you want dollars. No, I don't really mess with fiat. I'll keep stable coins, but I don't ever go to really the bank if I trade crypto. But with the actual market market, like my market money, I just leave it in the account. I just leave it in my account. Yeah, I don't no, pull here's it out. what I'm trying to figure out. You're saying profit and stable coins, which means dollars is your base. Uh, you hold it in stable coins, but dollars is what you, is how you think, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're judging in, in, you're in judging your success end, based upon how many dollars it, you have. If I right? sell, you're saying, right? Sorry, like you're saying, if I sell it. Well, no, I mean, so look, when when you're trading and when you're investing, you everyone should have a base that they're trying to accumulate, right? So most people in the world are trying to accumulate dollars. Um, there are people in this world like myself who are just trying to, they measure their wealth in the number of Bitcoin they have. Um, others more recently and in, in over time are measuring their wealth in terms of how much ETH they have. Um, you got to, you got to have a base at which you think this is, this is what I'm aspiring to accumulate and measuring my wealth in. And it sounds like yours is dollars, right? Uh, I mean, I would say more Ethereum, uh, I keep a very smaller percentage of USD if when I do have it, it's very, very short lived because of volatility of Ethereum. It's very easy to buy. Okay. And so so your, your, your goal, your goal is to your, your base in terms of how you think is Accumulate my wealth is how much Bitcoin, how much Ethereum do I have? Sorry. Yeah, right? I want as much Ethereum as I can possibly fucking get. Okay, cool. So in, in, so what what we're saying here is that most people should have a base, right? Um, most people are fiat thinkers, so they think in, in dollars. Um, but if your base is ETH, then what you what you should what I think you should start measuring is each month do I have more ETH than I had the previous month, and if I or each year do I have more ETH than I had the previous year, um, and then that could be a measure for you judging your success in trading. Um, but you've got to have a base. And most people are thinking, you know, what, what is their base? And so for me, my base is Bitcoin because I believe it outperforms inflation long term. And on a risk adjusted basis, um, I think it's the best place to have my savings. Um, and that's because I don't need them um, because I, I make sure I earn enough. Well, in, where I live on the island I live in, we, they accept British pounds. Um, but so I've got enough pounds to cover what my expenses are in, which is spending and then saving is your base. And then you're investing because you're either trying to protect from certain risks happening or you're trying to outperform your base. 
um, and achieve alpha or beta or whatever you're trying to achieve on that. And so this is where I think people need to get their heads around is what 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 is their base and are they if you're successfully accumulating every year more ETH through your trading than you had the previous year, then you could say you're a successful trader. Yeah, fairly fairly up on ETH. So my my um uh, the before I give the mic to Burden, would you consider this trading, uh, Simon, Richard, or anybody? Um, so our strategy is. Uh, you know, obviously VC investing. So we invested in, in over 200 projects privately last year alone. And then when we get, so as a VC, what you have is just for the audience to understand, v you get distribution. Just understand, by VC, do you mean equity or you're investing in? Tokens? Uh, tokens, tokens. Tokens through private rounds before they list. So what we do is obviously VC investing, you've you got to bet on that, you know, 5, 10% that does extremely well. And that's where you make your returns. Now, the beauty about crypto is that you get that initial distribution um, when the project launches. And when the project launches during the bull market, every project was doing a 10, 20 X, sometimes up to 100 X. No joke, it was fucking stupid. And then obviously everything dropped by over 95%. Now our strategy, unless we're incubating a project, so we're, you know, Wahid of Faith is on the panel, he's one of the projects we've incubated. Um, unless we're incubating the project, we sell that first distribution, whether we love the project or hate the project, which is usually about 5 or 10% of our tokens. And every distribution we get in the bull run, where everything is sitting at 5, 10, 20, 100x, we just sell it. Because we know that most VCs got liquidated in 2018. And we know, like, it doesn't take a genius to know. Like, you don't need to be, um, have an edge or anything to know that. This is not sustainable. The same way 90% of NFT projects were pumping, um, and I missed that whole the whole hype. So what we do is we sell the distributions down then, unless we have an agreement with the project not to, or unless we work with them. Um, and then obviously, as soon as the market corrected, our portfolio dropped from from nine figures to eight figures, like every other VC. And then we just obviously there's no point in selling there unless the project rugged or we know it's like just complete shit. Uh, so we sell the we keep selling even though it's down by ninety five percent. So I don't consider this um, you're a trader, trading. Dude. You're a trader. That's a is it? But but how how is that? So so my question is how is that how is that trading? Because you you are we just covering our risk by selling? Is again we're not talking about Bitcoin or ETH or any of those. Then again I sold I stabled up uh, about October November last year just because I just it was, everything was too hyped up. Again when I trade. I fuck up. I've tried it once on a platform called Deso. They do creator coins. I've tried trading there. I was one of the like 5% that lost money on the platform during the bull market. Everyone made money. I'm a horrible trader. But how is it trading when you sell distributions you know can't go up or, or can't go up much more and you know they will go down when every project or 90 percent of projects were doing a, a 10x no every project every token that was launching was doing a, a, a 10x or more it, when we did worse. our calculations it, it's worse than trading because your base your base is zero so anything you sell out is a profit um, and that's what's wrong with the vc model when they got into liquid tokens uh, the vc True. model was built was built off there is no liquidity you have to build something of value you can't sell it unless you create value. Um, you, what I, what you're doing, that to me is pumping and dumping. We don't do the pump and we do hold a lot of these tokens. We lose money on some of the tokens. I look at it as covering your risk. So you're investing, you sell, now obviously you don't sell at 10X all the time and there has to be enough liquidity. You cover your risk because you're responsible. As a VC, you need to make a return. That's, that's the goal. We don't pump anything. I've never promoted a project yeah, in my life. It's a different asset class. You're a hedge fund. A, v a VC doesn't have liquidity. A VC is, is creating... Now the, the, I, I, agree, I agree with you. I want to say this. I agree with you, and I've, 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 I've spoken about it very loudly. The model is broken. Now, am I a hypocrite by actually participating in the model? I wanted to invest in a lot of those projects long term, and we're holding... Uh, a lot of VCs are still liquidating to this day. We haven't liquidated anything, pretty much anything all year because obviously the market corrected. So we're holding a lot of those tokens long term. But if you don't sell, considering the high failure rate of projects, if you don't sell during the bull market, most VCs, even some of the top VCs right now are getting liquidated. I agree with you. The model is broken. But cover, but from taking profits versus trading, I know in some, it overlaps at times. But other times, it's just again, you're just taking profits. Yeah. I don't sit there watching charts. Or, or, or trying to time every investment I make. But at the same time, when I see everything pumping and things being overly bullish, taking profits from projects we invest in, 
I don't yeah. see that and, as uh, a trade. Yeah. Everything you're doing there is why why they created security laws in order to prevent people getting on the wrong side of those trades. That I agree with. 100% agree with that point. And right. I also agree with the models broken. I also agree that, and I think a lot of people that would come in on those trades, I want to also make a disclaimer. A lot of those projects pumped even further during the bull market, like Blocktopia, for example. We put in, uh, let's say we put in 50K. I can't remember what the number was, or 60 or, or 100, I think it was 100K. We put in 100K in Blocktopia. We sold when it launched at 100K. Within weeks, that 100K became worth uh, eventually um, multiple eight figures. So it's one of the top projects we invested in. So we lost a lot of uh, upside potential as well, which kind of goes, you know, supports the point that trading doesn't work. But at the same time, we covered our risk wherever possible when the markets were too hyped up. Yeah. At, um, at, Anthony it's, it's, game, it's, a, it's a short term arbitrage, but it, it's a regulatory arbitrage, definitely. Yeah, and it's. I want to also in, in, again. In I want to these laws. They would, when that happens, they call it a scam, and it does happen pre-IPO to IPO. Um, but those are the types of things where um, investment banks get a lot of shit when it happens. And I also want to stress. I want to kind of support the point you made. The model was severely broken. No lockup period. So eventually, lockup periods started coming up. The model was severely broken, and lockup periods are necessary because at the end of the day it's the retail market um, that eventually gets fucked so i want to support your point there but also find it irresponsible if we don't sell when the market is just too frothy because otherwise what's the point yeah, it's, a, di it's a dilemma go. from an opportunity and and um th this is where when you when you're doing that you have to become a trader you're driven to trading that's a good point because that's exactly the point like Exactly, like when we don't sell and then we see every other VC selling and that's the dilemma you're in, unless you're sitting on, on fucking that's a billion problem. dollars. That's the problem with liquidity on startups. Um, it, 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 you've got to create the value, whereas you can trade without creating the value, which leads to scammy behavior. And then you miss out on things like blocked up. But even blocked up, you don't miss out because you've got a distribution of 5%. You're still holding 95% of your tokens. And then when the bear market hits and liquidity dries up, there, where we sell distributions, we impact the token price heavily, and we're in a bear market. So, what's the point of selling? So, in yeah. that market, that's a different story. Yeah, and then you get the exchanges playing the game, and then you get the market makers playing the game, and and this is the shit that just that ends up with regulators jumping in. Exactly. Now, what we do just to kind of uh, point, you know, just be uh, completely open. Our strategy is very clear and open. We tell the project, hey, when we get the distribution, we're going to sell because the market is too hyped up. And the project generally agrees and they know that's a strategy, which is even weirder. I'm like, it's like the project and the VCs are working together. And then I'm like, who, who, who's, who's on the other end? Now, people on the other end made money because they were flipping it as well. So it was all like just pure well, speculation during the bull market. Yeah, someone brought. Eventually, exactly. Eventually, the last one holding the ball is the one that lost. And yeah, you just never you know. know. I, I get it. You, your, your analogy is they were probably DGENs uh, anyway. Um, no, look, I don't, I don't want to take it away. Maybe some of them bought and held. So I, um, I don't want to take it away and, and just, plump, you know. Yeah, but they got I the shit price. They, they, they invested in an early project and got the, the shit price. And now they've got to shit, sit there for years hoping that this project turns around. Exactly. And then to make it even worse, the VCs investing early, even us, like to, to get into that space, you had to be early in crypto. You have to have connections, reputation, same as the NFT space, which even though I'm part of those networks and those tribes, getting those early projects, getting that deal flow and getting access to the projects because we help them with you know marketing and all that. So projects want to work with us. Even though I'm part of that circle and you know we've made money being part of that circle, it's it's just it's the ugly side of crypto. It's but, just not and right. And we see yeah, there's something internally, right? This is how I felt when I worked in um, in the investment bank and market making. There was something in your body internal that didn't quite feel right. Yeah, it, I mean, it was cool. You're making money, but there's something that just you, you could you maybe can't articulate it, but something feels a bit wrong, right? I wouldn't say it feels wrong because I never participated in pumping projects. So the people that were pumping the projects or promoting them, I think if I was doing that or we were doing that, I'd feel very wrong. But at the same time, feeling wrong in the sense that the I'm part of a broken system. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and here's the key to being a great trader and a great investor. Don't, don't be ethical. Um, don't, don't have that kind of emotional tie. And 
That's but the I would say, I'd say if you if you cross if you cross I would I would counter this if you cross the ethics line the influences that crossed the ethics line in 2018 don't exist today the influences that we're pumping projects right now they're pumping them and selling them to their audience there's a reason I never pump a project obviously ethics is one but it doesn't make business sense either I'm throwing away my reputation so I'd say being unethical if you're anonymous, but if you've got a following and no one knows you're being unethical, then you're lucky. Um, I don't even know how to be anonymous. Um, but if you're a public figure, you've got like the, the ROI on building a reputation in crypto is in, insane. You know, Richard's built a, a massive following in the last few years, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's seen the return with the community he's built versus before he built that reputation. So building a reputation in crypto, there's multiples in ROI versus... Um, real life um but at the same time you know destroying it is very easy because reputation is all you got um burden and anthony all you guys you have, have your hand up go ahead guys yeah i just want to chime in kind of from the, the project owner side of things as well um and from my experience some of the best conversations i've had in my life have been with vcs and some of the worst have been with vcs there are good characters and bad characters right and there are precautions as a project owner that you can take like such as vesting schedules and so many more just as any other startup business to protect yourself and your business and your project and your community and your investors beyond the vcs you're talking to um, so if you're making the right choices then you're enabling yourself for that success and, and i think it all comes down to education again it's really about education and this being such a new space there's that lack of education and that's where that opportunity for the system to be exploited as a potentially broken system comes into play but realistically if you're educated and you're doing the right things you're securing yourself and saving yourself and without vcs we're in trouble as some of these uh, indie startups yeah so, so i want to i want to mention add one more thing there i think and something that could be music to your ears if you do the wrong thing as a vc so if you sell when you say you're not selling or if you dump and hurt liquidity or if you dump during bear markets um so and when you do it in a way that harms the project or you hype up a project or you publicly support it and then you dump it um that again that destroys your reputation you stop getting deal flow so there's a lot of vcs that didn't give a fuck and i'm, I'm not naming anybody and they don't get the same deal. Are these, are they these like um, actual? When you say VCs, are these like actual regulated VCs, or are these just whales that have like? No, no, I'm, talk, I'm talking. talking about re most of them are regulated VCs. You know, whales that have it as a side job generally uh, are shunned upon in the space, and they don't get allocations. So allocations are very limited. So it's a very small circle of investors that get it. Um, and then you, you get the likes of Anamoka and Reese and Outlier. These guys wouldn't send deal flow to people that do the wrong thing. So. Uh -huh kind of self-regulation is, is working better than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you've got even those regulated VCs, they've got, you know, they've got investors and they have to do the right thing. So it's always a balance. We want and to maintain the, our reputation. What's the, un, what's the unwritten contract in terms of when they can sell? Um, it, it depends what you agree on with the project. So outside the vesting schedule, there's like, you know, a, 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 a gentleman's agreement. Now you can easily break it, but then the project will just tell other VCs and VCs will put you on a blacklist. So no, there's, no, there's no one cares, Mario. They break it in a bear market. Everyone's breaking. The, and that's you what happened. So that, this right now, so. yeah, exactly. Don't... I don't want to. What I want to say, Wahid, is it's it's fascinating because the people that were on the golden list, they're like the VCs everyone respects. They're like when a bear market hits, all rules are off. And suddenly you got all the biggest guys no longer giving a fuck. And Three Arrows Capital was in the top tier. We had a guy, our CIO, gave me a top tier list of top VCs, like 10 or 15 of them. Three Arrows Capital was in the top, top of that list. Okay? Uh, and well, he do you remember those days? Everyone was like, get into Outlier, get into Three Arrows. And look what happened to them now. So obviously they didn't do it based on ethics. They did it out of necessity. But then a lot of VCs during the bear market, they built a reputation. Again, I don't want to mention their name. I wish I could, but I won't. Um, they built a massive reputation to never dump. And well, hey, do you know who I'm talking about? Would it, both, wouldn't it be you know, cool? Hey, wouldn't it be cool if someone invented something that made it so you couldn't dump and you had to live by your word? You could call it the truth engine, you know? And it would penalize you if you dumped early. But then if you didn't dump early, you got rewarded by the other people's penalties. That would be like so cool. You could call it Hex. We have vesting contracts for that. <laughs> we smart contracts. We, we, we code out smart contracts that release on particular schedules. And I guess there would just be a few more lines of code to add the rewards to be redistributed to other people. Yeah, yeah. that's if you're in programmable money to change finance, program the fucking money. I'm in this to remove human counterparty risk, not to add to it. Did you so with Hex, did you do a private round? I don't know, you didn't. You just did an airdrop to no, Bitcoin. It launched, 
It launched totally complete and sufficiently decentralized at launch. So this is this is why this is why you didn't face that issue. So what happens with projects is that instead of airdropping, they need the money. I don't think you needed the money. So because they needed the money, they did that private round with VCs, and they during the bull market, everyone was giving unlocking schedules. At least shitty projects, good projects, they gave very limited unlocks or no unlocks. So our best investments are locked for at least a year. Um, so when you do, but I mean, like algorithmically, to... even crappy can't do anything with it. Bitcoin has algorithmic locking, like check time lock verify exists, or rather check lock time verify. It's a feature, you know. Has anyone else yeah. on the panel invested privately in projects? I'm actually curious. Any other? Uh, I, we didn't invite any VCs today, but anyone invested privately in any projects? You did, Sam. You did a lot of those, but you did it with yeah. long, you know, equities. All our equity investments are locked. Yeah, well, tier we, one projects we, we had are uh, most of them are locked. Yeah, we we had an interesting experience because we built. So obviously, we built the first securities business in Bitcoin. Um, and then um, in 2017, we got disrupted because all of our clients um, stopped selling equity and started doing ICOs. Um, and so we had to build a process by force uh, because we had no clients left um, for how to um, sell a, uh, allow people to sell their tokens in compliance with securities laws. Um, but we got completely disrupted. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've invested... You know, my, my best ICO was obviously Ethereum um, and, uh, yeah, did loads, loads in between. But um, the, 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 again, yeah, it's, it's just I'm at that long-term stage because I just don't. These games drive you, again, bringing it back to the topic, these games drive you to being a trader where you have no choice but to be a trader. Um, and then you're going to have to learn the skills of trading in these games or it's just going to be, you know, a short-term thing. But eventually... It's a very, everybody... it's a very, it's a very, Simon, it's a very short-term thing. That period, the period I'm referring to was like a four-month period last year where 90% yeah. of projects were doing 10x or more. There was a big debate within the company, like, should we hold? Should we sell? We decided yeah. to sell because it's a logical thing to do. But generally, that's not the case. Next bull yeah. run, will that happen again? We don't know. NFTs, though? Fuck. NFTs are insane. There's no lockups in NFTs. Everyone getting whitelisted was selling at, at 10, 20, 30, 40 X's and everyone that, that buys in early. The NFT space was ugly. So I'm waiting for regulators to come in there. Um, I, had a, I had a question for Richard. Can, with, your, with your whole hex thing, can you, uh, can you hold NFTs for a prolonged amount of time or is it just uh, other things? Nope. The only thing that you can lock in hex is hex itself. It helps uh, hex go up. We don't want to dilute our primary feature to help pump other things that aren't the thing we care about, you know? All right. Well, I'm, pu I'm putting a patent on that idea, so I'm not taking it. I think, I think prior art would uh, make it not possible, but you could try. You can't patent things that are, have prior art. Like, even if no one ever registered the thing, it's, once it's in the public, you, you can't patent it. You say that now, but once the tables have turned, Richard... <laughs> respect, bro. Respect. Anthony, Bolivian, anything to add, guys, before we get into the coin fashion segment? Yeah, I think I'm going to jump off now. But yeah, I think um, liquidity creates this really interesting issue. So traditionally, the markets have worked on um, that if you get in early, you have to be in it for the long term. And um, crypto really disrupted that model. And liquidity is both a gift and a real a real problem for I'll actually I'll actually I think you like this Simon before you jump off Wahid what's your experience you you're an equities guy uh, you, you know you, you run a hedge fund you've been in that space for a long time and then you launch a token project and seen <laughs> crypto during a bull market and crypto during a bear market <laughs> enlighten us Wahid you there um I'm in a little bit of a loud place. So I'll try my best. Um, no, nah, the mic is good. Sorry, yeah, but I'm in a little bit of a loud place. But anyways, um, look, um, I am. Um, I'm, I'm going to. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm a long-term investor. I'm in private equity. Uh, obviously, a Web3 project is is a little bit more liquid than what I'm usually used to. And uh, you and I uh, met in in my in our whole pre-IDO um, 
time and you and others told me that if you don't get these VCs, and I'm not going to mention them, you don't get retail. You don't have a good IDO. And for me, it wasn't about a pump. It was, uh, Mario, let's be very uh, honest with one another. You were like, Wahid, you're all about long-term value creation, etc. I respect that. But if you don't pump, you're going to be considered a loser for the rest of your life. And I'm like, holy shit, that's a big hurdle. And then you told me, Wahid, if you don't do a 10x, you're a real loser. And, um, and, and you and you and I are very close friends, Mario, but I was under a lot of pressure to make sure that I was not a loser, even though nothing about the idea was really about long-term value creation. So we, we loaded up, you know, all these VCs and, uh, you know, no one really wanted to care about long-term value creation. They were all about what's your circulating uh, market cap at TGE, where's the squeeze. And, you know, we went down this rabbit hole of pure zero value creation. And all the value we created in our in our fashion company, our open source fashion ecosystem for 22 years, I was like, my gosh, it's too late to cancel. And we have to go down this thing. And then even we launched on the day of the Ukrainian invasion and everyone called me saying, cancel, delay, delay, cancel. And I said, fuck it. We just spent all this money to do this. It was a complete waste of time, a complete loss of energy, frankly. So we're just going to complete it. And then lo and behold, my hunch was correct. All these great VCs turned out not to be great. They ended up, you know, absolutely dumping. We are still at IDO or slightly above IDO. And now I, I, I'm told by the VCs, that's a miracle. And since we're still 2x from our seed round, you know, we reserve the right to keep selling. So you just can't win. So I, for all the speakers that said this is a shit process, I agree. I hate it. I wish I never did it. But now we have a live token. We have a great project and we'll just live with it. And, and to add to the point you've made, Wahid, is that these VCs that sold Wahid's coin, just to yeah, end it with this. You told me they were the creme de la creme, the best of the best. It, they and they were. Shit. Okay. Yeah, so, so the thing is, during the bull market, just you want to unmute, man? Unmute, because I can hear myself double. Yeah, so, so just to echo what... what oh yeah, Wahid, can you mute? Testing, testing. Good. So, so to, to, to kind of echo and, and support what Wahid is saying, is that... The, 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 the VCs that sold, at least, actually, Wahid, I have a question for you. I want to end it with this. The VCs selling now, were they the ones that, were some of them sellers in the bull market or generally, is actually, is, are any of them holding? Like, is there many holding or any of them holding or not really? You got to unmute and speak. Sorry, just because I'm in the place, I'm very careful. Look, um... I can, I can tell you the majority are selling because even if we outperform, the fact that we outperform and someone else is down 95%, their way of r running risk is to just sell the winners. And, you know, uh, and, and, and... That's insane. But that's yeah, crazy. Because like they're so, Because they're not... It's a bear market. market. They're not all these it's guys. It's stupid, they're not Richard, though. They're not Simon. They're not all these guys that have been there for 10 years. Okay. The, the whole space... Is a bunch of kids okay and so i don't know what to tell you but no i think the majority are sellers and there there are some funds that got extra tokens because quote unquote they give you advice and and they um you know they're, they're there for the long-term success of the project it was all bullshit but anyone who actually signed a contract to that effect those guys i'm absolutely crucifying i'm yanking yeah, just all to... their bonus tokens of course yeah, because they didn't deliver on their end. But just to, to kind of conclude, uh, some of these VCs that Wahid is talking about, again, I'm not talking about shitty VCs that just came up. We're talking about people that have joint funds with Anamoka. We're talking about people like Three Hours Capital. Uh, Outlier Ventures almost came in, but I'm, Outlier Ventures don't sell. Um, so, uh, the, the, Jamie's been on the show for a few times. Um, but yeah, Anthony, any final words, man, before we go to the uh, coin confessions, a few confessions, and then the... And Simon, I know you've got to jump off. You can jump off anytime, bro. Thanks a lot, as always, for coming on today and tuesday all right no worries um you know that's absolutely fascinating a few things i'll say in closing i'm um, like mario i love the transparency of um how you just bring these um issues to the front and just discuss them out in the open when they're kind of ha hiding in the shadows um and the other thing is that the fact that you know that your uh, vc sold because you have all the blockchain addresses and you can call out bad behavior and stuff is a pretty cool part of it um, but yeah, liquidity causes issues. And here's what I'm saying. If you guys, were, if anyone wants to trade, trade, it's your, it's your choice. It's a free, it's a, it's a free choice. But at some stage, you have to get to long-term investing value creation. You have to figure out what your base is and you have to come up with an investment, an investment thesis 
to pull your trades out and put them into investments. So that could I be got, creating I, a business or it could be investing. Yeah, I got. I got. I want to just say like what you just said now is probably the most important part of the show. And I think Richard, you said the same thing earlier. Is that business? And if you look at my slogan on on my website, Twitter, etc., do good, do it consistently, be patient. So be patient is what Simon just said is about investing and holding and waiting. Do good, do it consistently. That's not be me being a very nice person. That's just business sense. So to make money, unless you're a scammer and that's not sustainable, um, to make money in business, you got to create value. And whenever you see a, a you know, the, the play to earn model early on wasn't creating any value and it wasn't sustainable. Everyone called it a pyramid scheme type model until it started creating value, such as players enjoying the game or socializing, etc. So with any organization you build, any project you launch, if you don't um, create value, no one will pay you because they're not getting any value out of it. And that's not just in crypto. So that's why Richard and Simon made the point is that you got to create value. And then the other point is that most of the billionaires in the crypto space or people sitting on, on hundreds of millions of dollars, most of them are people that just held very little. None of the top 10 wealthiest or top 20 or top 100 wealthiest people in the world, as far as I know, none of them are traders. So I'm not you know, shitting on trading because it works when the markets are inefficient. Sam Bankman-Fried made his money through arbitrage, not trading, but still, because um, the markets were inefficient back then. A lot of guys in the NFT space made life-changing money, seven, eight figures, generally, you know, six or seven, uh, out of nothing because, uh, you know, they just traded during the bull run. Um, so I, I'm, in crypto, it works, especially in your asset classes. But as soon as the market, you know, you can't trade Bitcoin. I had the guy, we hired a guy to do, to lead our trading desk that we started a month ago. So we're doing the experiment. And then two days ago, he sends a message in the group, so he has a thesis. He has a certain pattern he sees with certain you know, altcoins that's working well for him. So we're testing it ourselves. We'll update in the space how that's going. It'll be an interesting experiment, even if we lose, I don't care. Um, but he said something two days ago. He's like, Mario, buy Bitcoin. I lost my shit. Uh, like, I, I really got upset. I'm like, man, you saw an inefficient market, which is altcoins on a certain exchange. And you saw a model that's repeatable because it's been working for you. Suddenly now, and that's what happens with traders. Suddenly now you believe... You're smarter than everyone else. You're smarter than institutions that spend millions of dollars hire the smartest minds. They've got uh, algorithmic trading to try to make money. And that's what leads to efficient markets. And you and your brain and your eight hours a day or 10 hours a day, and that has never traded in his life until a few months ago, are going to outsmart them. You can't trade Bitcoin. It's an efficient market. People are ahead of you. But you can trade, in my opinion, you can trade inefficient assets but it will just suck up your time. I'll, I will never trade. My time is too valuable for that. But hiring people to trade, I'm testing. Um, so it kind of be my conclusion. Simon, do you agree? Uh, cool, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, it's just uh, hiring people to trade. I haven't done that one. But, um, yeah, it's a uh, long-term value. I think there's some, some gold dust there. Um, I'll do a final shill if I can just before I leave. Yeah, you never um, shill, man. Please do. Yeah, if you um, want a free video series on um, exactly how to put together the investing part, not the trading part, uh, then head over to retirementplanb.com. Uh, that was yeah, if you can, Simon, you've been, you've been on the show a few times. So, so Romy will DM you just to get the link to it, and I'll do a tweet about it a few times because um, you've been on, on like 50 to 60% of our shows. So um, we'd love to tweet about it as well. And it's not a trading, it's not a trading uh, course or, or, or video. So I, I, I've never promoted any trading videos because I just think it's too risky. But investing, uh, more than happy to tweet about it. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, See you. Thanks a lot, Simon. Richard, any final words before we get to the confession? Yes, segment? sir. Yes. Everyone, please enjoy your free airdrop on PulseChain.com. Remember, this Ethereum merge was awesome, but it's not going to make fees lower. And it's not going to give us higher throughput. It's not going to have quicker transactions. So it's going to burn less electricity. It's going to help the price go up because it's going to inflate less. But for the more supply and the world's largest free airdrop, copy of all your coins on a new chain, that's PulseChain.com. Hex.com. Is that, is that what's, the, what's the, what, what, is it a proof of stake blockchain for, for, oh no, it's an ERC yep. token, isn't it? For Pulse. No, Pulse is a full copy of the Ethereum oh, network. Oh, yes, yes. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. State and yeah, everything. And it's yep. A, Proof of stake. Yes. And also, uh, Hex.com dipped real good. It's had 1,000 days of perfect, flawless operation. Price went up a million percent. Dip 95%. Uh, it's up off of the 95% dip now, I believe. And uh, this guy's going to cross the street. No, nope, they're going to let me go. Um, also, 
we got pulseax.com. It's a fork Uniswap does fee burning and stuff, whereas like the Uniswap token has no relationship to the exchange itself. Ours really does. So in all of these tokens, like Pulse Chain only deflates, there's no inflation. Pulse X only deflates, there's no inflation. Pulse.com, or rather Hex.com has an inflation rate of a maximum 3.69%. The average stake length is actually seven years. So it's miraculous. Like for normal retail investors to delay gratification on average seven years, that means you got to have a lot of 15-year stakes to cancel out a lot of one-year stakes. I mean, that's rather Nobel Prize worthy to get people to delay gratification that much. And between you and me, the only thing any price chart in the whole world cares about is buying and holding. And everything else is a meme and a story and a narrative as to why you should buy and hold. So Bitcoin used to be peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. It gave up on it. Then it was going to be programmable money. Gave up on it. Then it's digital gold. Maybe that one will last. But it went up, you know, 69,000 X. 690 million percent. Uh, Richard, um, I, I, have a, I, I want to ask you a quick question before we, we move on yeah. to the next segment. It's one well, I'm curious just, about. Just saying, we monetize the only thing that Price Chart cares about, which is buying and holding. Everything else is bullshit. You hear about people like, you know, we're going to green out the dump, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Oh, we're going we're gonna to buy for the merge, we're going to buy for this, that. It's all bullshit. Why not just give the inflation to the people that have the longest time horizons? And what do you think happens with, when you have something that people lock up for 15 years when they buy it? I mean, that's the most real commitment that you can possibly uh, ever make. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, Richard, question I have, and that's a selfish question. So I remember the early days in crypto when you were just in your studio, and I know you made a, a lot of money being early in Bitcoin and, and pre-Bitcoin as well. Um, and I remember you were just pretty, I think from memory, you were pretty humble sitting in your studio. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't have all that flash that you have now. And then you started buying, I, I, I didn't follow you for a while. Um, and then I saw you with the Lambo, with the Rolls Royce, with all the clothes. And I think you mentioned, I'm going to, you know, people like it. I'm doing it to get attention. You know, I know Ty Lopez, a lot of people hate him. He's like, Mario, I just get, you know, it works. Um, if the end value of what I'm providing is good, well, I'm, what am I doing? I'm just trying to get attention through all that branding. Now, obviously you get a lot of hate from all the flashiness as well, among other things. My question is, does it work when you're building a personal brand? Like I'm doing a lot of videos and stuff. My team started telling me buy branded clothes. Now I can never get even close to your level of flashiness. But how well does it work? It grabs attention. The the attention you get versus the hate. Is the attention, the so, ROI outweighs the hate? I mean, if you're on the internet, you're going to get hate. Vitalik, I mean, Hex went up 10,000x. It's built on Ethereum. So thanks, Ethereum. Right? Hexagon's got tons of free airdrops because of Ethereum. Thanks, Ethereum. Everybody that has a bog standard ERC-20 never got a 51% attack like every other altcoin got. Thanks, Ethereum. And everyone still hates Vitalik. And he writes free open source software. He funds uh, anti-aging medicine. He funds uh, anti-other uh, like health things. Like The guy's out there writing free open source software. Now, yes, he did make the top and sell the top on the day. Yes, he has done that more than one cycle. Like, he's not all golden. But, you know, he's not flashy. And yet, people still hate him. Because if people know you exist, they're going to hate you. And so the difference is, can you get the other side? If you're going to get hated anyway, can you get people to like you too? And so, you know, human beings have this thing built into them where they care about proof of work. How do I know a girl has enough fat resources to supply the kid with nutrients after we have a baby? Big old titties. Extra resources what? serve no extra purpose at all. Huh? It's signaling. So you can go on Wikipedia and search up social sexual signaling theory. And how do you know that a bird has enough resources to take care of your uh, little baby bird? Well, look, it built this cool nest and it's got all these extra stupid feathers that provide no other utility. And so I just bought today a $10,000 Louis Vuitton kite. I don't even fly kites, bro. But now I got a $10,000 Louis Vuitton kite that I'm going to go make fun of people with. I got see-through bags. I got the stupidest things. I got ping pong paddles, Louis Vuitton ping pong paddles. I spent like $150,000 over the last couple of days on fashion stuff. Just to flex. People haven't seen it yet. Now, why am I doing that? Because no one cares that I raised $27 million for charity. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that I cur a cryptocurrency that went up in price a million percent in two years with flawless, perfect operation. No one cares. They care more that I own the world's largest diamond. They care more that I'd waste $10,000 on a stupid kite. Now, do I wish I lived in a better world? 
where we had a real meritocracy. And if you did better things, you got more viewers, more likes and more power and more influence in the world. I wish I lived in that world. You know, I've written free self-help books. If you followed the advice in them, you'd land where I'm landed right now. Constant orgasm. But people don't read the books and they're free. And they've been out for years before I ever said a thing about Bitcoin. So, you know, I live in a world where you can either cry like a bitch about how the game's set up or you could go win the game. I chose to win the game and my people chose to win the game. And by and large, we're winning. So, you know, if you say you're rich, show me your Lambo. You say you're rich, show me a $10,000 kite. It's proof of work. It's hard to fake that crap. It's very hard to fake a car. Easy to fake some of the Louis crap, but very hard to fake a car. And so when people see that you got, look, man, if I see you got a cool ass car, I am going to walk over to you and say hi because I want to meet you because I think that's cool. If you're wearing a cool ass outfit, I'm going to walk over to you and say hi and be like, hey, man, why you got that cool ass outfit? What do you do? Tell me about you. And, and I'm, you know, I'm at the top of the game. And I will do that. I'm going to come up and approach you if you got a cool car. You got security with them. I'm like, hey, what's up with the security, bro? What's up? What's your thing? Is there synergy here somewhere? And so, like, it's it's a way to shortcut the human being's search Yo, for I truthful gotta, statements I, by proof of work. I, I, I got I to tell you this, and I'll give the mic to Bolivia, and then obviously Charlie's been too patient. But I want to I make fun of myself for a second. So I used to wear shorts and T-shirts and slippers. For most of my life, my, I never branded clothes. You know, people that know me, including Romy next to me and KK, they, I looked I looked like a homeless person, even though I was successful well before crypto and e-com. So I'm pretty comfortable in life. Now, I started wearing branded clothes after um, a, a gentleman called Gorav, who runs the biggest incubator in crypto, one of the biggest. He's like, Mario, even wear like subtly branded clothes. I only wear black. I've only worn black for years. Subtly branded clothes, it makes a difference. And then I found out a few months ago about watches and the entire industry of watches. So I got an AP, could get another one. And it's true. Now, when I wear a watch to a meeting, they look at it, even though I hate fucking watches. Watches, Branded clothes, people say, oh, nice hat, nice Dior sh or Louboutin shoes or Dior t-shirt, whatever. So it works. But I'm still very subtle about it. Tomorrow, so I'm a bachata dancer as well. I travel the world. I'm in Greece today dancing bachata, um, which, you know, as an artist. As an artist, you have to be flashy. So <laughs> people are going to hate on me potentially now because I'm going to try for the first time to be really flashy. So I've got like a, 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 the, the square two, I think it's called, I can't remember, D square two, jeans full of crystals, all of it, it's black again, a, a crystallized Versace t-shirt, and a jacket, Balmain jacket, heavy as fuck, full of crystals, and then my shoes, my Giuseppe shoes, also all crystals, so I'm all going to be like a disco ball, and I usually have a videographer with me, filming me, so anyone on my Instagram, you can see that, filming me all the time, usually I just wear a suit, so I look sharp, it's a branded suit, but I can't see the brand. That's what I've always worn. First time ever tomorrow. I, I don't know if I'll check it out. I'm going to give it a shot, see how it goes. And if I get, so as an artist, when I go dance, girls line up to dance with you because you're considered an artist, which is really good for my ego. And plus it's fun. So I want to see if it's going to work now when I wear crystal shit. Will people avoid me more because I'm way too flashy? Will I get other artists, you know, talking shit about me? Or will I have a bigger line of girls lining up to dance with me as an artist? So the experiment it's, it's will be tomorrow. Be totally I can already answer these questions for you. It's totally a function of how comfortable the girls are with themselves. The girls that think that they're high value and are comfortable being looked at don't mind walking up to the most interesting guy in the place and meeting him. But the girls that are shy and don't have high opinions of themselves and are afraid that they'll be looked at because they're talking to the spicy guy in the room, they'll avoid you. And so it's really what kind of girl you want to attract. If you want to, you know, attract a girl that sits at home and reads books and is wearing glasses and shit and sitting on the wall, that crystal shit will turn her off. But if you're talking to the girl that's, you know, got her ass hanging out, the crystal's going to play hard. And traditionally, if you're actually being judged on your movements, it's a lot easier to see movement when we've got sequins that reflect light and when we can see the intersection of your limbs to your body, which is why ballet dancers wear tights. So the intersection of their limbs to their body is as tight as it can be, so it shows the most motion. So there's, you know, there's a, a strong tradition in the arts and in dance in particular to wear tight fitting, sparkly clothing because it helps you see the movement better. So I think it's gonna work out well for you. <laughs> okay, but I feel, I feel like embarrassed even talking about this. Bolivian, <laughs> without hating on me, man, any final words, welcome to the show.